everybody. Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 537. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources and joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, how are you holding up over there, bud? Oh, we're good. We're good. You know, uh, we are uh, sheltering in place, uh, as they say these days, um, and just uh, trying to get through all this and actually pretty busy as, as it turns out. <laughs> yeah, you, you've been really, really busy as a result. I mean, you you were working from home anyway, but now you've got a whole bunch of other responsibilities well, and changes and things on your table. It, it turns out when uh, when you can't sell magic cards and you're a magic card selling business that you have to pivot. And we've been working on a lot of stuff in order to do that. I, I'm really happy about it, though. Uh, thanks to Wizards of the Coast, just definitely. Uh, magic Fest Online is a really cool thing that uh, we just kicked off. You know, yeah. you can play these these qualifiers during the week, there's a weekend uh, championship every weekend and that's, that's on arena, but we're doing 24 seven live coverage of it. Uh, I, I, I put in an eight hour shift with uh, Huey yesterday and uh, you're, you're going to be doing some coverage coming up this weekend. I know that. And I'm actually yep. hopping right from the show to go back and do more coverage. So a lot of really awesome stuff. I'm really thankful that I get to do some cool, cool things, but uh, I'm not, I'm, I am definitely keeping myself busy. This isn't one of those, uh, Netflix and chill sort sort of situations. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited for this uh, for this online thing. I mean, this has been talked about for years and years. Hey, I wonder if we could do you know a large scale event online. And now there's been a big push. Sure, it wasn't really the way we wanted, uh, but like you said, thanks to Wizards of the Coast responding and uh, everybody at Channel Fireball really mobilizing. Uh, this is starting to come together, and I'm really grateful for it. I mean, for multiple reasons, it means I get a little bit of work, but also, uh, I mean, I just miss. Doing, I miss commentating. I miss, you know, interacting with the community outside of the show and stuff like that. I've actually been doing more draft videos too. For um, I've finished mine up for CFB for the month, so I started doing some more, just for, you know, just for whatever reason. For I put them up on the Patreon, but they're actually open to anybody. And uh, oh, Luis, I had one of the most absurd games. I've ever played for sure uh, on, oh, yeah? on one of those. Yeah. I, I don't want to spoil it, but I want to put like a link to that, to the, you know, the critical stretch of it, like on Twitter. Cause I'm just like, <laughs> this, this game was just absurd. Um, but at any rate, uh, those are up on, on the Patreon, but again, they're open to anybody. You don't, you don't have to be a patron to see those. And they also of course go to the LR YouTube channel as well. Now over at channel fireball though, it's not just coverage and you scrambling. There's some uh, sales stuff going on too, right? Yeah, so what we're doing right now is uh, we're doing a store credit sale. And wh what that is, is you can go to channelfireball.com slash sale to take a look. We're, we're basically selling store credit and you get a uh, bonus store credit when you buy it. So you can buy, you know, $5 of store credit for $5. Think of it as buying a gift card or what have you. Mm -hmm. But if you buy it in larger amounts, you get more of a bonus, like uh, $110 in store credit for $100. So, oh, nice. Uh, we'll, you'll be able to use this as soon as we're back in operation, um, you know, which we're going to have to let, let circumstances dictate. And a big part of this, and I want to be transparent about this, is we want to keep bringing you Channel Fireball content. We 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 love doing content. I love doing content. But in order to do that, we we need to figure out ways in order to 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 be able to offer it responsibly. Uh, and you know, because we we have a lot of costs as 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 do any company, especially one that <laughs> currently can't can't do its main thing. So, mm -hmm. uh, if you if you want to help support Channel Fireball content, this is the best way to do that. And uh, you know, we appreciate any amount uh, you 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 can give us. Uh, and you know, you're going to be able to get your stuff hopefully soon. But again, that's that's not that's not not up to me, and not really up to any person, as it turns out. Yeah, and you know, uh, based on on that, but also our Patreon and stuff, it, it has been really inspiring and cool to see people, even in uncertain times, right when it's scary and and you don't really know and that kind of thing, uh, come together to help support uh, everybody else, right? And like you said, supporting content creators is is important. And I don't know, it, it's become more important in the times when you know you're isolated, right? When you're by yourself, that's why I've been doing the draft videos and stuff to try to ease that burden. I mean, it, it's tough because. It's weird to contrast it, right? You, you've got like people like us to, who do magic content, which is really not the most important thing in the world. Let's be honest, right? But also, you know, bringing some relief to people, bringing making people feel a little bit le less alone is important. And so there's this weird thing where I'm like, well, what can I do to try to help out with this? And I'm like, well, the best thing that I could figure out in the moment 
is to is to make more content and do more videos and stuff, but it doesn't okay. feel how, like much. There's people that, that are really sick, you know. It's like okay. I can do more know. craft videos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. It's it's a weird oh, but thing, look, but, look, mm-hmm. uh, but look, I've this also is something been turning think, to content myself. Yeah. You know, I've I mean, been listening th- to more podcasts. Yeah. So yeah, I think we both end up uh, kind of in the same spot where there's a lot of folks doing much more important work than what we're doing. You know, we would not argue mm-hmm. that whether, whether that's, you know, uh, healthcare professionals who are on the front lines fighting or, or, or people who are working at grocery stores or people who are working, you know, at, at, at delivering food or, or packages like those things are, are critical right now. And you definitely want to give those people a lot more credit than us, mm-hmm. but we can do what we're good at and what we're good at is making content. And we want to be able to continue doing that. And, you know, I think that, I think it's something that can help folks, kind of take their mind off this. So we, we, you know, I don't want to belabor the point because I do want to just talk about magic, but uh, I, I, I think that it, it's been awesome seeing the community response to all this as we try to figure out ways to uh, bring value to the community while, you know, and because we like what we do and we yeah, uh, continue to do absolutely. it. Absolutely. If you want to check out any of that stuff we just mentioned, as far as getting the store credit from channel fireball, it's channel fireball.com slash sale. And of course the Patreon for limited resources is always patreon.com slash slash limited resources. And as I mentioned, you can go find the the videos there too. And, and you don't have to be a patron to, to watch them. And the first vintage cube one is the one I'm talking about. That was completely ridiculous. The next one I did was uh <laughs> Also had a, a, a I, certain I level of ridiculousness too. But. To mention that uh, I, I feel kind of bad uh, because they they put the cube on Magic Online and I haven't really had a chance to stream it yet. I've just been just been slammed with all this other oh, stuff. Don't so. feel bad. You've been working. Well, I think man. I think I think instead of recording, I'm just going to go do that. So I'll, I'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, hold on a minute. You might make mistakes during the draft or game. <laughs> <laughs> or during the gameplay. And I feel like our uh, main topic for the show this week could help you not make those mistakes, Luis. So if you Definitely. stick around, you will get better. And of course, you as a listener will as well. We are talking cube. So look, everything you need to know about cube drafting, but we didn't know to ask, or maybe we're too afraid or whatever. We're, we're going to go deep on cube. Now, th- there's... A, Insert a, whatever 90s self-help book. Yeah, you, exactly. You <laughs> We've... Our, our, our goal is to make you better at cube and especially for folks who haven't really cubed much or at all, kind of give you this on-ramp though. There's plenty here for experienced cube users as well. Right. And and that's really the key is that there is a lot of depth to cube and we're considering this sort of the broad strokes come on in, you know, the water's warm type of show. But we've also got like an archetype type show lined up as well, where we can go into more individual archetypes. But we're going to be talking about a lot of cards and uh, a lot of the things that you need to know, particularly if you haven't cube drafted uh, much or at all. But even if you have, this is good reminder stuff. And it shows you at least how Luis and I kind of um, look at the topography of how cube works. And it might help you uh, as well. I, I mean, to, to use the analogy that uh, that we talked about when we were discussing the show notes, I feel like cube is this thing that invested magic players love so much and people who are mm-hmm. newer or haven't cubed for whatever reason look at it and and they're like a they're like a teenager who's told that beer is great and they try a beer and they're like this is disgusting why are we drinking this? <laughs> and it's just like I, I don't know what i'm doing you know whereas cube, once once you once you learn kind of how to how to enjoy cube it, it there's a reason that people put it among their favorite magic formats ever it is literally my favorite format right so uh, but we want to make it more accessible because it really isn't. I think that's the biggest strike against it is it's, it's hard to get into. Right. So what we're going to do is uh, normally we would do a crack a pack here uh, and we actually will be doing one, but we're going to save it for the end of the show. That way we can apply some of the things that we learned during the course of the show to the actual crack a pack that we're going to do. So I've got one lined up. Um, I screenshotted it, but we're going to wait until the end. So let's start with the, the broadest strokes here we can. Uh, what is a cube? So a uh, cube is a at its core, a collection of cards that people draft from Mm -hmm. and it's curated, right? It's, it's, you, you choose the list. It's, you could make a cube with all kinds of different themes. The most common cube that people play is one that's either like vintage legacy or modern, which basically just means vintage is all cards and magic legacy is all cards and magic minus the power nine restricted cards. Mm -hmm. And then modern is, is like the last 15 years of cards. Dear Lord, modern's 15 years now. Wow, that's insane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, you're looking – so you're looking at uh, most of the time a collection of Magic's greatest hits. You know, think of a think of a great Magic card. It's probably in like a Legacy Cube. Mm-hmm. And 
there are some other cubes that folks make, which are awesome, like popper cubes, all common, or uh, peasant cube, common and uncommon, or a mono color cube. I played mono green cube before. It was pretty weird, but it was, mm-hmm. was kind of cool. Uh, people also make cubes that are less like cubes and more like just draft formats. Like an Innistrad cube could just be a collection of cards from the Innistrad format that you like, but it feels a lot more like just drafting that format. Um, mm-hmm. Recently, there was the cons cube on Magic Online, which is a bunch of cards from cons, but also a bunch of non-cons cards that were like thematically appropriate for cons. Right. So, but, uh, you know, the, the 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 long answer is really that just cube is, or the short answer is cubes of cards you draft from that you pick. The long answer is everything I just said. So, uh, right. We're going to be centering yeah. most of our discussions effectively on like uh, m- the vintage slash legacy cube experience. Cause first of all, that's what's on magic online line right now. Second of all, that's uh, just a, r- a really popular cube format in general, mm-hmm. but a lot of this is applicable to e- other kinds of cubes as well. Yeah. And you know, we are trying to go, I mean, basically what we're doing is we're focusing on the vintage magic online cube, which is the deepest and most standardized cube that you can have, right? It has the power nine. It has all the crazy stuff in it. And we wanted to go with the deepest cube because these, if the, the fewer, the smaller the card pool, the differently, the more different the, the cube will play out. And generally speaking, the bigger the card pool, the more options you have for uh, crazy interactions and depth and archetypes and stuff like that. And so when we talk about it, when we say the cube for the rest of the episode, we are talking about the current version of the Magic Online cube. So keep that in mind. Um, how is cube different from normal draft? Because this this is one of the huge – like if, if I'm a, a relatively – let's say I've been uh, playing Magic for a couple of years. I've drafted a bunch. I really like it. But I haven't yet uh, tried out cube yet. The thing that I want to sit down and go, so is this just limited, right? Like can I take the same principles that I've learned – to draft Theros Beyond Death and just, you know, apply them to what would feel like a different set in cube or are there fundamental differences? Um, I think that the, 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 the broad strokes are going to be the same unless your cube is very differently constructed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I said, there, there are some really, really different cubes out there. And in that case, you know, the, some of these lessons won't be applicable, but I think that this this holds true for basically any moderately high power level cube, any cube that has like good good lands in it that has cards like remand in it, which is a lot of the cubes. Mm-hmm. But but I mean, if I'm if I'm used to drafting Theros Beyond Death, I can expect a much different experience, right? With uh, the type of decks, the type of cards, the the way that things play out in a cube versus what I'm used to. Yes, it is very different from uh, just the d- normal draft formats. Um, mm-hmm. The, the 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 best way to just describe it is that it's a, it's so it, it's at a midpoint almost between constructed and limited, and yeah. if, if you're if you're uh, you know if you're an awesome LR listener who who, who disdains constructed, <laughs> don't, don't worry. Cube is much more uh, it, it it it's much more like limited in the gameplay, which I think is the best part. the 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 biggest part for con- the constructed part is building your decks and and knowing how to draft your deck because yes. The number one mistake everyone makes when they first cube, I did it, you did it, everyone does it, it, is you drafted a deck full of good cards. And Mm -hmm. first of all, you probably weren't right about which cards were good because you were used to limited. (laughs) But dude, Uh, it's a sword. (laughs) Right, exactly. Second, uh, decks in cube tend not to be good stuff piles as much as focus decks uh, that are trying to do a specific thing. And you know, the level of focus varies, but for the most part, the successful decks are the ones that are the most focused. So imagine build arounds and synergy cards being the best cards in the format. That's pretty much how cube goes. The individual best cards in the format, of course, are just, you know, if you're playing vintage cube, the like stuff like Black Lotus or Ancestral Recall, and those mm-hmm. are great in any deck, of course, but the overall archetypes are really important and knowing them is critical. Yeah. And, you know, w- one of the things that, that you'll note you know, when you sit down and, and you you start to think of that is if you want to contrast the way that we draft normal draft sets, we are striving for synergy. We are attempting to put together bits and pieces of synergistic interaction. But if you really are honest about the way that most, uh, you know, normal set uh, drafts play out, they are two colors 
and you are looking for the the highest average power level of cards in your deck you that will correlate with your win condition in most uh, your win uh, percentage in most sets meaning that even though we're trying to do like cool graveyard stuff and sometimes we're putting uh decks uh, cards in our deck that maybe aren't the most powerful option but they are the best for synergy so therefore our deck is more powerful the the raw truth of it is is that for the most part you're still defaulting to raw power level right and in cube Well, everything's very powerful for the most part, but you really are pushing in a direction. It is different. It is another level up from, from what we're talking about when we talk about synergy with, um, a regular set. I mean, I'm talking about a deck can do really one thing, you know, like it can have kind of, it can be a one trick pony and it can actually win. In fact, some of those are the best decks in cube. Yeah. And, and when, you know, you you know, the, the, the quote from, uh, man, I, I forget, I forget which, uh, the Incredibles, I think it's like, you know, if everything's powerful, nothing's powerful. Mm-hmm. That That is kind of true when it comes to cube. Yes. Where there are some outliers, again, your, your Black Lotuses or Soul Rings or whatever. But besides the, the, the top couple percent of cards, almost, and the bottom couple percent, because there, there, there's some Linvalda preservers in, in, in cube also. But mm-hmm. besides the top and the bottom, everything's powerful. That's why it's in the cube. You, mm-hmm. You're it, most of the time, you're not having to make decisions between Frexian, Metamorph, Lightning Bolt, Thoughtseize, right? These mm-hmm. are and these are all very good cards. So drafting on power level is is, is not going to get you there, especially since things that you think are powerful. In fact, you know, if I were to tell you, and you weren't experienced with Cube, what do you think's better, Preordain or uh, Primeval Titan, or Preordain or, or I guess Frost Titan, Preordain or Frost Titan? They're both blue. Right, and pre ordained like insanely higher on any list than than Frost Titan is a, is a yeah. much much higher pick. Yeah, yeah, right. Even though you know it, Frost Titan would be a you know it was probably you know top if, top if you were if you were in time or something. Yeah, if you were playing M eleven or or whatever M ten that 11. and you open Fro- Frost Titan and pre ordained you'd be insane to take pre ordained there in right. Cube. I think it's the other way around. Right, exactly. So, so what are some of the things then that change priorities wise if we are sort of awash in really powerful cards and we're looking to be more synergy uh, oriented? What are the things that, that flop around? Okay. The first thing that really, really changes is you have to draft a mana base in cube. In, in, in normal drafts, sure, sometimes you'll take a land if it's like what mid pack, you'll take a, 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 you know, a red green tap land for your deck. Mm hmm. Sure, it's just a, it's a minor note, and in fact, if you didn't know anything and never picked a land in normal draft, I don't think it would change your win percentage a whole lot. Like no. it's just smoothing out the edges. Yep. The opposite is true in cube because in cube you can have constructed, almost constructed quality mana bases, and may, maybe not quite that high, but like your average blue white mana base or any two color mana base in draft is nine eight, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes sometimes yep. it'll be ten seven because you got double colors of a card, whatever. In cube, if you if you're playing a nine eight mana base, you're giving up a significant part of your equity for for two reasons. One, your opponents are going to generally have better mana and they'll lose fewer games to stumbling on mana. And two, if you didn't take any lands, you're just going to end up with thirty five playables, and that doesn't help because you should still just play like twenty three of them. So using up picks on lands is totally fine because you almost always end up with more cards than you can than you can play. If right. There's just every card is great. So. It's really important to take lands and in particular dual lands and fetch lands. So dual lands are, are things like Tundra and Underground Sea and Taiga, just lands that tap for two colors and count as the basics of those colors. Mm-hmm. And then fetch lands like Polluted Delta, Windswept Teeth, you know, the, the lands where you pay life and sack it to get one of two types of lands. The key is that fetch lands can get dual lands. So imagine you're playing blue red. Which is, first of all, the largely the best color combination in, in Vintage Cube, and uh, one that tends to have s- somewhat severe mana requirements. If you get a Volcanic Island or Steam Vents, that's priority number one. Uh, it's a blue red dual land. Now any blue or red fetch land can go get it. So an Arid Mesa plus a Volcanic Island makes your blue red deck have two Volcanic Islands. Yep. And it, it it can get it can just go from there and there's also stuff like you know fast lands like spire bluff canal or or the 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 creature lands like wandering fumarole and those are fine but the priority really is duels and fetches because once you can construct a dual fetch mana base and it's especially more important in three color decks imagine you're playing grixis red black blue mm-hmm. and you have a bad lands a red black land and you have a scalding torn that fetches blue or red all of a sudden, that Scalding Tarn fetches any of your colors. You can use it to go get bad lands and get black and red mana, or you can just get basic island and have blue mana. Yep. You can also get basic mountain, but you're probably not going to do that when you have bad lands in your deck most of the time. Mm-hmm. But 
what you end up is now your Scalding Tarn's a try land. So you need the duels to make the fetches good. But once you have them, the fetches are, are, are generally going to be better because they, they can add multiple colors, all, all three colors of mana or more. Right. Uh, w- one thing I wanted to mention too, it, when you were talking about the big picture on, you know, getting a near constructed level mana base is something that I think a lot of people don't really realize because it's just what we have to work with in regular limited, but regular limited mana bases are bad. They're, they're actually not, you know, I mean, adept. Yeah. They're, they're like barely up to the task of giving you, you know, I mean, how many times have you lost because you didn't find your other color? It happens, right? It's not that often, but it happens. Well, and you're often in, in, in limited. Just you're going to keep a you're going to keep a hand sometimes that's like three planes of white card and three green cards. Yeah, and and then you're going to lose some percentage of those games where you never draw a forest, or you're going to lose those games when you draw a forest a turn too late. Mm-hmm. And it, as you might expect, cube tends to be fairly high power level and have fairly uh, fast games. Where if you miss your second color for some amount of time. Then you 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 end up in a lot of trouble. I I, I do also want to note that um, another way around this, by the way, is mono color decks, and we're we're going to talk about the different archetypes. But one of the reasons mono red and mono white are both they're both tier one fantastic archetypes in cube, and both of them are much much better than Boros. That's not a deck. Like red white aggro is not a deck. It's pretty funny because mono red aggro is a deck and mono white aggro is a deck. Red white aggro is just not not a good deck, and the no. reason is. You have to get a bunch of lands, and if you stumble on those lands, you're not going to curve out. Your deck's not going to be good. You know how you fix that? Your mana base is 17 mountains. Ta-da! Yeah. You don't get color screwed. <laughs> Done! Yeah. Okay, so we're prioritizing uh, lands higher for two reasons. One of – this is just to recap this. One of them is because we can create much, much better uh, mana bases with more consistent play. But then also because since we do have the same number of picks as a regular draft and we're not going to play all of those cards, if we take lands with some of those picks, then we're actually being more efficient during the draft by picking more cards and playing them. Yeah. That okay. Is, that, 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 that's a good summary. And then the, that leads us into the next part, which is right. – Cheap cards and cheap interaction is very important. And again, more important than in normal drafts where cards like Thoughtseize, Preordain, uh, Noble Hierarch, Remand, these cards are should go m- much, much higher in your pick order than your average four plus cost cards. And the, again, the reason is you're not lacking for power. And these cards either accelerate you in the case of like Noble, Preordain or Ponder help you find the, 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 whatever it is you're missing, whether it's lands, a specific engine piece, like, you know, one of the, one of the better decks in cube is a uh, Kiki Jiki slash Splinter Twin plus Pestermite Deceiver X Arc, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Preordain's great there. It can find you whichever piece of those you're missing. And right. that, that's really, really important. So, uh, it, it's really important to have these cards. And so what you want is you want a lot of cheap cards that help you Find your expensive cards or deal with your opponent's expensive cards. And as a result, I tend to, to, to really aggressively take cantrips to take cheap, cheap counterspells. Counterspell, remand, mana leak, miscalculation. These are all great. Thought seize and duress and inquisition are all great. Um, the, the green accelerants all, all tend to be pretty good. Stuff like signets is pretty good. Those are often in the cube. And the biggest change in focus is not expensive, powerful cards. You know, you're the, there, there are really good expensive cards in the cube. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Consecrated Sphinx or Fractured Identity or Treachery are weak cards. These cards are, are all great. Primeval Titan is a fantastic card. But it's it's really important to have the cheap cards because the difference between, say, Consecrated Sphinx and Inferno Titan. I mean, I think Sphinx is better, yep. but Inferno Titan is pretty good. Mm-hmm. The difference between those is not as big as the difference of not having a counterspell for your opponent's good play or yeah. not having – uh an accelerant to cast one a turn earlier. Like if I cast a turn five in Inferno Titan, it's going to beat your turn six Consecrated Sphinx, especially if I'm on the play. Mm-hmm. And, or if you cast Consecrated Sphinx and then I counterspell it and then cast Inferno Titan, well, it certainly goes to me. Right. So, you know, you can switch which of the six cost cards are, and it doesn't, it doesn't change the example, but you switch who has the counterspell, who has the thought sees, who has the signet, and it changes who's going to win by quite a bit. Yeah, another way to look at it, especially when it comes to the cantrips and such, is that these decks are so dense with threats and powerful cards that even if you took one of those powerful cards out and replaced it with a cantrip, that smooths out, A, your ability to make sure you hit your mana, 
your ability to do things in the early part of the game where some players aren't doing things and your ability to find the things that you need to win the game that you're playing. It adds a real kind of three-dimensional aspect to the deck where if it's just another powerful card, you will draw it, you might be able to play it, you might not. When we talk about these cheap cards, you know, we're talking about zero, one, and maybe two mana spells. There is a real emphasis put on those in cube from the really good players. The players that, you know, consistently do well at cube understand that these are the important things and it's not the the five and six mana cards. I I mean, when I start a draft with like Volcanic Island, Flooded Strand, Preordain and Mana Lake, I feel unbeatable. <laughs> yeah, you feel like you're just set. You're like, okay, I can breathe now, right? And, like, and, I can and, take what I want. And imagine if I told you you started a draft instead. You started with, like, Consecrated Sphinx, uh, Factor Fiction, Mystic Confluence, you know. And right. Like, I'm great. getting nervous just hearing you say that that's the start of my draft. I can see it on the screen and I'm like, oh, my God, I need to pick up a land or something. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's really good. Okay. Um, and then dovetailing on that. Um, so cheap cards, interaction, very important. They should be prioritized or at least, you know, you should always put pro- appropriate weight on them. That also means though that the finishers lose weight. In other words, the more expensive cards are, are, uh, are less important. Yeah, and, and look, you are going to need some cards like this in most decks. So you, your mono green deck needs like actually quite a few cards that are expensive in order to to have a payoff for all these elves. Your your red blue deck that has a, a signet and some cheap counters and a ponder it does need some sort of high end. So we're ne- definitely not saying you don't you don't want these cards at all, but it, it's just not as high of a priority because you can function with you know tier two finishers, and if you have tier one game leading up to that. The, you reverse those two things and you're you're gonna you're not gonna win. Right, you're not gonna be able to do anything. A couple of examples of this would be, for example, if you had a ramp deck, right? But you really lacked the early game ramp spells, the one and two mana ramp spells. Now, but but your finishers were amazing, right? Because you prioritized those over those those cheaper ramp cards. Well, you can see how this is turned on its nose. You're like, well, I'm not going to get to cast the finisher. So now if I show you another version where you did prioritize those cheaper ramp cards, the elves, those type of things, but then I replace your finishers with, you know, a tear down from the ones that you had in that first version, that deck's going to win so much more than the deck that is, you know, relying on a very specific lucky draw basically to uh, just to be able to cast those big finishers. So keep that in mind as one thing gets more important. I mean, drafting zero sum for the most part uh, another thing will go down in value and and we're highlighting here the cheaper interactive uh early game stuff versus the the big splashy game winning stuff and uh yeah, it's the latter that goes down here yep okay so let's uh let's switch gears here to a very big so so that's some fundamentals right so th- those are some of the differences that you're going to find where uh, if you come in and, and you're used to drafting just uh, normal sets. But let's just come in with some of the big hitters. I mean, everybody loves a good list and, uh, and, and talking yeah. cards and stuff. So let's talk about uh, not only the best cards in the Vintage Cube, though we're going to start with that, but also they uh, do break down into a few different categories um, that end up being really interesting for Cube. So first off, what are the big hitters? What are just the, the home run hitters for, for Vintage Cube? Uh, so I believe the single best card in Vintage Cube is Soul Ring. This is a, a mm. one-man artifact that taps for two colorless mana. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pretty busted. <laughs> it's uh, insanely busted. It actually nets you mana the turn that you cast it. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's an insane card. So I think Soul Ring followed by Black Lotus, which, you know, I, I wouldn't fault you for taking Lotus over, over Soul Ring if you wanted to draft Storm. Mm-hmm. We'll get to that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, if, if you want to draft Storm. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, but... uh. Soul Ring, Black Lotus, uh, Ancestral Recall, Mox Sapphire, Mox Jet, or rather, Mox Sapphire, Mox Ruby, Mox Jet, uh, Mox Pearl, no, Mox Emerald, then Mox Pearl, though I'm, I'm quibbling over which Mox doesn't really matter too much. Mm-hmm. Uh, Time Walk, I think, is slightly behind all the Mox in. And then, and then you're moving off of power because uh, I, I don't really count Time Twister here because that's, that, that's not a card you should really be taking early. Mm-hmm. Uh, into cards like Mana Drain, Jace the Mind Sculptor, Oko, Thief of Crowns. Yeah, he, he's up there. Oko oh, is yeah. absurd. Uh, Treachery, Mana Crypt. So these, these are the kind of cards that are just incredible raw power level. The power especially, like you should just take those if you see them. And, you know, it, it's hard to overstate how good Moxes are. They don't look that good. It's a, it's a mountain yeah. that you could, that doesn't make your take your land drop for the turn. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, sure. But you know what? The, the, the fact of the matter is getting to play a turn ahead of schedule for zero mana is just insane. 
Yeah, for no cost. There's no yeah. cost at all. Yeah, yeah. It, so, it's not, it doesn't charge you at all. Even this if is it's one off of my, color, just take yes. them off. Yeah, I always play off color mocks in, in the cube uh, effectively every time. Th this is one of my quibbles with uh, Vintage Cube that, you know, those picks, if you open up a mox, aren't particularly interesting. And Correct. so that leads to sort of the, okay, well, I guess I should take the mocks. But, but the, I'll tell the you, ability, the one thing I don't do is pass a mox. I just take yeah. them. I, they're awesome. And they do affect the game in a really cool way. It's not exciting. Like you said, it's like, oh, I get another land. But when you see what you can do with that other land, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, these are actually ama amazingly good cards cards, even if they are, uh, you know, a little basic. Yeah, basically, yes, I, I definitely agree that like, th that it takes away the draft part, but I, I, I like some vintage cube action. I mean, the way I would put it is if, if I could only pick one cube to draft for the rest of my life, I might pick legacy cube over vintage cube just because the vintage cube has really high highs, but those also, you know, can take away from the experience sometime. Mm -hmm. But Honestly, the best is to just rotate. I, I like playing one cube, then another cube, then another cube in order to get the different kinds of experiences. Vintage is just like the complete craziness, combos and moxes and all that. Uh, whereas like Legacy is really powerful synergy cards and, you know, trying to get those going, uh, but just not quite as fast as Vintage Cube. And then something like Modern Cube is a lot more playing to the board and creature based and planeswalker based games, which are also really fun. So right, right. I, I like a mix of those. Um, but those are kind of like the, an overview on the raw power level cards. There's a couple other ones. There's like Ancient Tomb is really good. And you know what's not surprising? How many but, of the cards we just talked about deal with mana? It's like Mox, Lotus, yeah, Soren, yeah. even Mana Drain to a, to a degree. Treachery untaps all your lands. It's three blue, blue, you know, steal any creature enchantment, but also untaps five lands when you cast it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they basically, and, and, and we should actually take a moment there because you're totally right. And th I will say that the way that I view Vintage Cube is mana is the name of the game. And most of my draft decks focus on, uh, creating huge amounts of mana. The three main ways that I do that are through creatures in green, uh, through artifacts or through spells in storm, which never seems to work for me, but I still do it anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, where you can, uh, you know, wh whenever you look at, at somebody playing and, and they've got, you know, 19 mana in their pool or whatever, and you're like, what? Right. And, you know, with the green decks, you can do that really early with the, uh, artifact decks. You can do that really early too. Um, mana is, in my opinion, king in the cube. Man yeah. Mana is the most important thing. So I focus on that early because I can figure out what to do with the mana. But if I'm the one who has the ability to, in a very short period of time, produce a lot of mana, I can generate an advantage that my opponent will not be able to overcome. So that's my goal, usually when I sit down to draft a cube. Um, next group of cards, also extremely powerful, but not in the same way. They're not necessarily just cast me and that's it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm great. These are ones that I would actually consider more in the build around category. These are cards that you... Uh, can take and play and are extremely powerful, but they require you to do other things when drafting and building your deck to make them good. You can't just put them into any deck like you can the ones that we named above. So what are some of the cards that come to mind for that? So some of these engine cards that you, you can really take these cards. I mean, all these cards on the list, you could take first pick and just build a deck around and you'll get, yes. you'll get pretty rewarded. It's like sneak sure. attack. Sneak attack is probably the best one in the cube. Yeah. I love sneak attack. It's an enchantment for three and a red and it says, pay a red, put a creature from your hand into play, it gains haste, sacrifice it at end of turn. So what you do with this is, unsurprisingly, you put really expensive creatures into play. Uh, Gristleband's the best one because it can find you more to just have a party. You can also put Emrakul to Aeon's Torn or really any of the Eldrazi into play, Woodfall mm -hmm. Primus, uh, you know, Dragonlord Atarka. There's just a lot of cards that if you sneak them in, you get infinite mana with Palancron and... Yep. <laughs> And, you know, there's a lot of cards where you, when you sneak them in, you, you win the game basically on the spot or very close to it. Uh, you also have channel, which is near and dear to my heart. It's green, green for a sorcery. You can, <laughs> until end of turn, you can pay a life to add a colorless mana. Channel and Banefire. So, yep. Channelbanefire.com. <laughs> Basic, the most common use of channel is Eldrazi, yeah. where if you just go channel and you play Emrakul, uh, yeah, you, you drop to five life on turn two, but they're just dead. You take another turn and, and yeah. kill their whole board. Yeah, and, um, and, and uh, by, by the way, I want to mention that with Sneak Attack and Channel, and you'll see this with a bunch of the cards. The Eldrazi do play a really important role. Most of them uh, can't be cast from the graveyard outside of Ceaseless Hunger, um, unless you have instant speedways to interact. But 
if you sneak attack in, it's worth noting, uh, you will not get the cast trigger, but you will get the annihilator trigger. And right. that's the really important thing. You know, you, you take out four or even six of your opponent's permanents and maybe kill them with the damage that's left over. It's really hard to recover. Uh, channel lets you do the cast part as well, although you don't get to attack immediately. So it trades off getting the immediate, uh, you know, lack of permanence on the other side for whatever happens when they, uh, when you cast it, in which case you're probably winning. I mean, Kozlek's the worst one and it draws you four cards. So you're probably doing fine. Yeah. And a, a lot of the cube is about cheating on, on mana for some of these ridiculous yeah. cards. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking of which natural order is the next one. This is a sorcery for two green, green as an additional cost sack creature, search your library for a green creature and put it into play. Yep. And so the, the, the best thing to get overall is crater hoof behemoth. Cause that'll just kill them. Most of yep. the time, you can also get uh, Avengers of Zendikar, Woodfall Primus, Terastodon, Primeval yep. Titan. Just all these cards are great to go get. And yeah, and, and Natural Order doesn't happen on turn four in those decks, it's worth noting. It's usually on turn three, but it can even be on turn two. Right. Yeah, and you're using just like elves. I mean, Llanowar Elf is the perfect combo with Natural Order. Yep. Um, yeah, oh, just, just to expand a little bit, both Channel and Natural Order are great for mono green. Sneak Attack is most commonly found in blue-red because mm -hmm. you can have a Sneak Attack – a Gristlebrand and an Emrakul, right? Just that that three card package. The through the breach is another card that it's like a backup worst sneak attack. Uh, yep. Plus a bunch of just good red and blue cards, and you have a very lean kill condition that's really powerful. Yeah, and it's worth noting there, by the way, that you mentioned this sort of just in passing, but people might be surprised. You do sometimes play creatures that you literally cannot cast. Oh, <laughs> if yeah, you're playing those are the sneak best attack. ones. <laughs> yeah, or, or, the, uh, or if you're playing Reanimator, which we're going to get to in a second. But it is funny to say, oh, my blue red deck with a card that literally has four black mana symbols in its mana cost. And it's just like, oh, yeah, and that is, as you mentioned, the best one. And, you know, it's worth noting here as well. You know, uh, just as a small aside, if you sneak attack in Grizzlebrand, you can draw the seven cards right away. If you have extra red mana, you can put in the creatures that you drew and then just get them with all of it at once. So, yeah. Uh, in, in, in Tomb is kind of a stand in for the whole reanimator deck. It's, it's an instant for one black mana that lets you search your library and put any card into the graveyard. So, mm -hmm. What this does is it not only puts a creature into graveyard to reanimate with cards like, well, the card reanimate, animate dead, necromancy. It also lets you get any, the creature of your choice. It's, it's both a tutor and a, and a reanimation outlet in the same time. So really strong. And if you take an early in tomb, I would expect you to want to basically pair it with those black reanimation spells plus, uh, large creatures that you can reanimate. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tinker yep. is, a uh, similar one. This is Tuna Blue. It's a sorcery. As an additional cost, sacrifice an artifact. Search your library for an artifact and put it into play. So here you get to play cheap artifacts like Signets or, if you're lucky, Moxen. And then tinker them away, sack one of them, and go get something like a Sundering Titan, uh, a Sphinx of the Steel Wind, a Blightsteel Colossus, just something huge. Yeah. One of the one of the classic classics is to get the Leviathan, the, the Inkwell Leviathan. <laughs> yeah, that's the seven seven eleven yep. seven ten seven eleven. Yep. Uh, like Island walk store. trample uh, shroud, so it's untargetable. Yep. So, what are some other build arounds? Uh, Kiki Jiki. You know, we yeah, we talk so, about Kiki Jiki and Splinter Twin being you know one of the combos. There's actually multiple cards that combo with it, but the two classics are Pestermite and Deceiver Exarch. These are both cards that uh, are creatures that enter the battlefield and let you untap something. So the idea is. You put the Splinter Twin on your Kiki, excuse me, on your uh, Deceiver Exarch or Pestermite, then which lets you tap it to make a copy of that creature. You do so, then you untap the original, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again, and you can make as many of those as you want and kill your opponent. It's a classic two card combo kill. And in the blue red decks that Luis has been talking about, it's actually quite easy to uh, find yourself in a position to find them because of all the card drawn cantrips and stuff. Yeah, and again, you can you can. I mean, ideally, this deck does want as many duplicate or redundant effects as possible. But uh, even with just one of each, you could, you can potentially put together a deck. So the two ways to copy creatures are Splinter Twin and Kiki Jiki, mm -hmm. and both of those work with Deceiver Exarch, Pestermite, and Zealous Conscripts, which you know when it when it comes into play, it untaps something. Yep. And then there's also Restoration Angel, which doesn't work with Splinter Twin, but does work with Kiki Jiki, where you. Right. Copy the angel, flicker the kiki, and because it has haste, it can just you know do it do it again right away. Yeah. So 
usually this is a blue red deck, but uh, sometimes it splashes white for a resto. And then, of course, it likes the, it likes other creatures with good enter the battlefield effects and stuff like that. Yeah, because you can you can always put cards like uh, Splinter Twin on some some value creature. It's not really where you want to be, but you can do it. Next one's one of my favorite cards in the cube. Took me a while to kind of warm up to it, and then I was like, oh, this is just completely stupid. It's opposition to blue blue enchantment. Tap a creature that you control to tap a permanent that your opponent controls, or maybe it's artifact creature it's- or land. But yeah, it's probably, I think it's just artifact creature or land. But yeah, yeah. I, basically what you want to do with opposition, the most common is blue green because it the elves again accelerate out opposition, and then there's like that. Not only do they fuel it, there's cards like deranged hermit or biogenic ooze. So you just or avenger of Zendikar, you just tap down their whole board. They can never cast anything. Yeah, and what but, you do what you do with it is is you actually tap down their lands on their upkeep. That's the, yeah, that's exactly. the trick, right? So you go go they the, all of their stuff on taps, and then you have let's say four creatures, and you go okay, tap all your lands, and they're like, all right, go. And then on your turn, you play two more creatures, and then you say go ahead, and then you tap down all their lands and one of their creatures, and then they say and they play a land and say go. So they get at most one mana, or maybe a little bit more for the rest of the game. And there's no deck that can survive that. So once you get that lock. They are uh, only able to play instant speed stuff. And if they can't take care of opposition at instant speed, then they can't win the game. And, and you yeah. just win. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it doesn't even have to be blue green. I, there's also blue white with like lingering souls or blade splicer. And then even sometimes blue red with like P and Kiran Nalar that can, uh, that can help get you some tokens, but <laughs> it's a really strong card. Um, and then upheaval is not, it's unique in the fact that it's the most uh, powerful of, of the big mana payoffs, this is a, a sorcery for four blue blue that returns all permanents to their owner's hand, including lands. So what you want to do with upheaval is generate a lot of mana, as much as you possibly can, cast it, then replay as much of your board as possible. Your opponent's turn one will be land, discard seven cards usually. Yep, <laughs> that, that's, that, that's usually about right. Yeah, because the ideal upheaval turn involves not playing a land yet, tapping everything you have for mana. Let's say you can make 10 or 11 mana, floating the rest of it, then playing a land, and then, as you said, replaying as much of it as you can. Typically, you'll replay your ability to make the mana that got you to that point in the first place, and then your opponent does what you said, and then on your turn, you play like a five drop, and they're like, okay, I'm just dead. You know, they, they just can't ever come back from that. Extremely powerful effect. Also interesting in the fact that it's not a sweeper. Like it's not, it doesn't care about what's on the battlefield. All of it goes away. All the tokens, all the planeswalkers, all the shroud stuff. It doesn't matter. It's all going away. Nothing stays on the battlefield if an upheaval resolves. And that lets you solve a lot of different types of problems that you might find yourself in. Your opponent's way ahead on mana. They have five planeswalkers. They have an army that's going to kill you. Upheaval is sort of the catch-all to all of those things. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't really matter. The only thing that you care about is if they have something suspended, like a Riftwing Cloudskate, or there if go. there's an Oblivion Ring in play that'll unlock a, that'll now unlock that whatever it, it was under it. Mm-hmm. But upheaval really rewards you. Uh, the, the decks that contain upheaval are traditionally big mana blue decks or blue green decks. Uh, that because basically all you're looking for is a way to generate a lot of mana because it's not great in a in a in just like a normal fair deck, but. If you can, uh, if you can generate seven, eight, nine mana and then replay some stuff, especially acceleration, you end up in a really good spot. Yeah. Last one, um, is sulfuric vortex. So for you mono red fans out there, this is the build around card for mono red. All it really says is, Hey, I want to be in a mono red deck, but sulfuric vortex is really, it's probably on the short list of, uh, most hated cards in the cube <laughs> because it's, it's honestly just so good. It's one red, red for an enchantment. It says at the beginning of each player's upkeep, it does two damage to that player. And, uh, and players, if a player would gain life, they gain no life instead. Yeah, it, it, it's awesome. It it's it puts so them, brutal. It puts them on a really fast clock and prevents them from gaining the life that will often get them out of this clock. That's right. So that's another you know kind of build around style card for the um, for for different type of archetype in this case mono red. Now there's another group of cards that fall in a similar category. Some of them require build around. Um, some of them are, are just powerful, but uh, they're. And and some of the cards in in our prior category do uh, also uh, fall under this description, which is that they're unique effects. These these are cards that you, if you pass them and you don't get it in your deck, you will not have a shot at another one. Because in a little bit, um, I'll go over some of the the lists, the the different groupings that you'll see in cube. 
but uh, these ones defy that. They they don't sit in there. One of one of them that comes to mind is is balance, right? And balance is probably the worst named card in the history of Magic. It's anything but balanced. It's it's one in a white sorcery. Each player chooses a number of lands they control equal to the number of lands controlled by the player who controls the fewest. Then sacrifices the rest. Players discard cards and sacrifice creatures the same way. So what it does is it says if I have three lands and you have eight. You have to uh, get rid of five of your lands. If I have zero creatures and you have a hundred, you have to get rid of all of them. It's whoever has the least. All players have to have that amount. And it's the same thing with cards. If balance was the last card out of my hand and you had four cards in your hand, you have to discard all of them. So this is not a effect that you see in any other card in the cube or really in magic. Um, another one that comes to mind, by the way, and it's actually kind of a two pack here are Gaia's Cradle and Telerian Academy. And these are low-key, just two of the best cards in the cube, full stop. These cards are absolutely broken. Gaius Cradle is a legendary land that taps for green for each creature you control. And Telerian Academy is of the same ilk, except for it makes blue for each artifact you control. So these are lands that can tap for four, five, eight, nine mana from one land if you've built out your board. And of course... The sick part about these type of uh, lands is that they build on themselves. You play a Gaius Cradle with like a Llanowar Elves out. So it only taps for green. It's just like a forest. Okay, no problem. But then the next turn, you use it to play another creature. And now you've got two. So the turn after that, you can tap a few lands first, play a creature or two, tap your cradle for four, play another two creatures, and all of a sudden your, your cradle's tapping for eight mana or whatever, and you can win the game easily. Particularly, these cards are good with untap effects, Gaia's Cradle and Tolarian Academy. If you have a way to untap them, like Luis mentioned, Treachery or cards like that, uh, and you can do it again. I, I'm a big fan of Garrick Wildspeaker, the original Garrick. That guy untaps Gaia's Cradle like a boss and lets you just, you know, dump out huge stuff on the battlefield uh, that your opponent won't be able to do. These lands are not replaceable. That there is no other effects in these colors or in the, you know, for these decks that are as good as these. These are the best lands for the, these two archetypes, which is creature based ramp and uh, artifact based ramp. Another one, fast bond, right? Fast bond. Not every deck wants it. This, in fact, this is a card that you often don't end up playing, but it's green enchantment. It says you may play any number of lands on each of your turns. Whenever you play a land, if it wasn't the first land you've played this turn, it, uh, fast bond deals a damage to you. Just one. But these are the type of cards that, if matched up with the right things, can go completely nuts. For example, I'll just name a couple of the things you can do. If you have a card that says draw seven cards in some variety, there's a bunch of them in the cube. We'll talk about them in a little bit. This lets you play all of the lands off of those right away and potentially play all the cards that you drew off of them right away, which can put you way, way ahead of your opponent. For example, another one is you can set up combinations where you can play every land you see off the top of your library. So for example, if you have a card that lets you look at and see, uh, look at cards off the top of your library and play them if they're a land, which there's a couple in the cube that do that, you could play every one of them that you hit, no matter how many of that happens to be. And then perhaps the most powerful combination is ends up being a three card combo. So it's not easy to put together, but if you get fast bond strip mine and a way to bring uh, play lands from your graveyard, of which there are two in the cube, uh, then you can strip mine away their whole mana base. All of their lands go away, uh, you know, at the additional cost of one per. Again, there's just not other ways to do that in the cube. So if you're in the market for things like this, then fast bond's the only way to do it. Uh, one of the next cards that we've got is actually a very new addition, uh, to the cube. And I know that you, you and I both, uh, are very high on this card. We had somebody ask us, Luis, on uh, Twitter about it. And we were both like, well, this card's way better than it looks. And it's Fractured Identity. Uh, this, this is a commander card. Uh, it's three white blue for a sorcery. It says exile target non-land permanent. So basically anything on the other side. And then it says each player other than its controller creates a token that's a copy of it. So, of course, that means you get a copy of it. So think treachery, right? You could steal a creature. This has a very similar effect, except for that it's anything. It's a planeswalker. It's a artifact. It's a key enchantment. It's anything on the other side. And uh, yeah, to say you're getting your five mana worth is is an understatement. You love this card, right? Oh, Fractured Identity is insane. because yeah. You don't realize how good it is, I, I think, until you play with it. Because it looks like similar to gain control of a permanent, right? They have it, yeah. now you have it. 
but it's got a couple differences. One, you get the enter the battlefield effects of that permanent. So when mm -hmm. you fracture identity, they're primeval titan. Not only, not only are they down a titan and you're up a titan, you also go get those two lands right away. Awesome. Uh, the other is it can do this to, to planeswalkers, which a lot of these cards typically can't. And it, it also uh, means that if they have bounce, they don't get their creature back because their creature's gone. Yep. And Bounce will kill yours because it's a token, but it's be much better than them uh, them getting them getting uh, their thing. Yeah, or a disenchant, right? Like th they can't disenchant this. You know, there's a lot of those type of effects, right? Too. So, um, yeah. Overall, so, this card's super powerful. It's really, really powerful. And again, th this type of effect is actually strong enough that you're not really going to get it back. Another one, Living Death. This is three black black sorcery. Sorcery, each player exiles all creature cards from their graveyards, then sacrifices all creatures they control, then puts all cards exiled this way onto the battlefield. Now, this isn't one of my particular favorites. I actually like playing Reanimator with the cheap uh, get one thing back really quickly rather than setting up this huge living death turn. But if your deck's really great at getting creatures into the graveyard and you can cast living death, it's really powerful. And it is an extremely powerful way to get back five huge creatures while wiping your opponent's board. Another one, an absolute classic, is Mishra's Workshop. Now, there are lands that create more than one mana in the cube. Um, it's not the only one that does that, but Mishra's Workshop, uh, which is a land that taps to add three mana to your mana pool, uh, but only it, it, you can only spend it to cast artifacts, that is irreplaceable for a heavy artifact deck. It's just absolutely the best thing you can be doing. Um, another one, which you wouldn't think so, necessarily by seeing it, but it actually is uh, not really replaceable. It's called Recurring Nightmare. So this, at first glance, looks like a reanimation spell. It's a two and a black enchantment, and it says, sacrifice a creature and return Recurring uh, Nightmare to its owner's hand. And for doing this, you get to return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. You can only activate it at sorcery speed. And so you think to yourself, okay, fine. Like, I can play this, and then I can basically trade creatures. One of them dies. On, from my battlefield, and then I get one back from my graveyard. But the thing is, you're returning Recurring Nightmare to your hand, which means you can cast it and do this again. You can even do it right away. And this lets you set up really insane loops where you can do it multiple times in a turn, where you're getting Enter the Battlefield triggers all the time, and uh, and where you can trade off you know, an Elf for a 7-drop if you have the right way to, to discard it, and you can repeat it. This is one that you can actually do multiple times in the mid mid part of the game just to get value. You bring back your Mole Drifter by sacrificing your other, you know, your Mana War or whatever, which isn't in the cube, sadly. And then, you know, you sacrifice the Mole Drifter. It, it's it's sometimes the, in the cube. <laughs> it's not right now. Yeah. And yeah. then you sacrifice the Mole Drifter to get back the Mana War and bounce their creature. And then you replay it. It's just like, what the heck? This card can be a, a total engine to, to get you value, or it can just be a good reanimation spell in the right deck. Another one, Sylvan Library. Uh, Sylvan Library is uh, a green repeatable counter uh, uh, card draw spell, which isn't something that green uh, gets, generally speaking. They they have a lot of ways to generate cards, but Library is really not the, the type of card that you see, in fact, ever. It's a one in a green enchantment. At the beginning of your draw step, you may draw two additional cards. If you do, choose two cards from your hand drawn this turn, so of those three. Uh, for each of those cards, pay four life or put the card on top of your library. Again, it's a weird card. Just super, super old. Um, and it's just not really replaceable, that effect. Um, and then, of course, Tangle Wire. Just kidding. I hate Tangle Wire. <laughs> Tangle Wire is, is – it's probably at this point underrated because it, it – there's a long time when everyone made fun of it as being so bad and people would always play it, which yeah. is largely true. But it does have its uses and uh, I, I think that people are probably – it's probably a running joke at this point so no one plays it. This is an artifact that costs – three mana and it enters the battlefield with four counters on it. Fading counters. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> At the beginning of each player's upkeep, uh, they tap down four artifacts or lands or creatures uh, for, or one for each counter on it. So you play it, they mm -hmm. tap down four things. Then on your turn, it fades down to three and you tap down three things. One of which is Tangle Wire mm -hmm. and uh, so on and so forth. What basically what is where you want to use this. Cause I do think it has uses is in aggressive decks, especially, uh, if you've got a, maybe a, a Mox or something like that or an Ancient Yeah, yeah. So. so it can do some things, but generally speaking, I try not to play it. Um, 
<clears throat> okay, so so those are some of the really big picture looks at the power, the power level, uh, the high power level cube cards and how they break down. You know, some engines slash build around cards, some unique effects that you don't want to pass uh, if you if you're in the market for those things, and then of course just the pure raw power of you know the moxin and, and the really uh, heavy stuff. So where do we want to go now? Some of the traps. Yeah, I think that uh, addressing some of the traps that people are going to run into. Uh, in cube or in, in hoping them avoid them. Uh, so the first one is the classic green black removal deck. This, this, this oh, somehow yeah. every, everyone stops on this, uh, on this deck. It's the first stop on the train to, to, to learning how to cube. And yep. <laughs> basically a deck full of doom blade equivalents and good creatures is not a very good way to put a cube deck together. So you don't want to be, if you can describe your deck as mid range, you usually are not super happy with the result mm-hmm. because if it's controlling and has counter spells and discard and, and maybe some card draw or a good finisher, sure. You don't have to be doing necessarily busted things to have a good cube deck. And if it's aggressive, that's totally fine. And if it's uh, got got some good combos and all that's fine. If it's mid range where it's trying to just take the reverse position of whatever it plays against, eh, that that's usually not going to work out in cube. The decks are too focused. Yeah. They're too um, focused and they're too fast. Yeah. Uh, cards that, fall into kind of the trap category for me are cards like Brightling, Thrag Tusk, Carnage Tyrant, Linval the Preserver. Basically, cards that require a lot of mana and don't have a big impact on the game relative to that. Like they don't have a good enter the battlefield effect or death effect. They don't uh they don't have, you know, a, a really, really dangerous thing. Like Consecrated Sphinx, if this sits in play for any amount of time, you will win the game. It almost has an injured the battlefield effect in that sense, mm-hmm. or you know, or some or any of the titans. Those are all great because they immediately do something. But cards like Thrag Tusk even has an injured the battlefield effect. But cards like Thrag Tusk or uh, Thrun is just not. They're, they're not gonna. They're not gonna close out the game. Lyra Dawnbringer is just not a good card. Right. So Bane's these are that, angel. All of the yeah. Right. I really need an injured the battlefield effect out of a five mana creature. Really need right. It. Yeah. And, and these cards have their purposes. I like them as sideboard cards against aggro, for example, if you're talking Bane yeah. Slayer or Thrag Tusk. But, mm-hmm. you know, or Carnage Tyrant can sideboard against like an actual control deck. But these cards are generally just you're not getting enough out of your mana uh, to, to, to justify what you put in. Uh, another pair of cards, which I, I think is worth mentioning, is Show and Tell and Eureka. These are both cards that let both players put things from their hand directly into play. And... The reason I think that these cards are so bad is you play this card, you put your Eldrazi or your Titan or whatever it is you want into play, and your opponent does the same, but they get the first crack at it. So if you put, both put in similar things, they're usually going to be ahead because they get to attack first. And often your opponent will either get to like make, you know, this, this helps them assemble their combo. Imagine you, you cast Eureka and you put in Progenitus and you put in, uh, you know, Emrakul and you put in whatever and they, and they put in Kiki Jiki and Pestermite. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Or, or, or they put in Sower of Temptation, take your Emrakul and then just attack you with it. Oh, I've done that. Yeah. So there, there's a lot that can go wrong there. Um, and, and you're the mo- one paying both the mana and the card for this privilege. Like, right. Sometimes yeah. you'll have these cards without something to put in it. Whereas like a reanimate card is one-sided. You you just get the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, mono black is also uh, something people like drafting. Whenever whenever there's a Phyrexian obliterator in the draft, then, you know, so, someone's going to draft a mono black deck. And generally mono black falls into the mid-range removal and good stuff category that, that you don't want to be in. Whereas yeah. I think – if you get mono blue, your deck's probably busted. It's hard to get mono blue because I think around four to five people draft blue on any given table. Yep. And if you get mono, gre- mono green, mono red, or mono white, those are all great decks. Mono black's the only mono color where I, I – if you told me you were a mono color, I would say, oh, that's cool. If you told me you're a mono black, I'd be like, oh, well, that's probably not going to work out. <laughs> Unless – the one exception is mono black reanimator. I do think that deck is very good. Okay. But that's, again, because you're doing something kind of busted. Yeah, because there are some cubes that support mono black pretty directly. But uh, when you get to the upper echelon here, it doesn't hold up. So um, the you know this, this segues into the next question, which is how many colors can you play in cube? Mm-hmm. Uh, I would actually recommend if you haven't cubed much to start by learning the monocolor decks. Uh, because you don't, then you don't, you just kind of opt out of the whole mana base thing and you don't have to worry about, oh, should I take this Thought Seize or this Polluted Delta? Cause that's, a, that's a close pick if you're blue black, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, mono red, mono white, and mono green are all attainable and great. Mono red, mono white are aggressive. Mono green is looking to ramp pretty heavily. 
and, you know, finish with like a natural order or a green sun zenith or Nissa into crater hoof, that sort of thing. Uh, and then mono red and mono white, you know, the mono red deck is beat down with sulfuric vortex and strip mine and burn spells to finish things off. Uh, mono white is you want taxing effects like Thalia and you want Armageddon. So there's Armageddon, which is three and a white, destroy all land sorcery, and uh, Ravages of War, which is the exact same thing. It's just the portal yep. version. Yep. So it's really important for Mono White to have those effects because they uh, th- what they want to do is play a creature on the first few turns, then cast Armageddon on turn four. And yep. then that, that'll give your creatures enough time. That's their disruption. And and they're, they're really the only deck that can consistently take advantage of those two Armageddon effects that float around in the cube. So not a, not only are the o- the only deck that wants them, they're the only deck that it's actually good in as well. So you yeah. get them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you you two colors is pretty common in cube. Just make sure you have the, the the right lands. You probably want around four or five lands that produce your two colors in order to to do that. Um, and you can play three to five colors. Three colors is you, you can manage uh, any three color combination with enough fetches, duels, and signets. Once you're at four or five, I would mostly expect you to be green, and and have a, a, a green base of like Kanama's Reach or you know Sylvan Carriage or that sort of thing. Mm-hmm, for sure. So the the archetypes that are good. We we just talked about mono red or mono white. Those are the the, the two most uh, the most common aggressive archetypes. Uh, for control, it's gen- it's just going to be blue based. There's any control deck that doesn't have blue is probably flawed. I mean, no, I don't. You know, just, there are some flawed, individual yeah. drafts, but if you're black white control or red white control, the, the problem is without access to a good to good card draw, your control deck is just not is just going to going to falter because the the game plan of countering or discarding or killing their plays doesn't work that well when you don't have ways to draw extra cards. Right, and. Also, the not not just drawing the cards, but seeing many of them. If you're going to try to react to what your opponent's doing, you're going to need to have access to the different types of answers you have, and blue is the best way to find those. Yeah. So the blue based control decks are like blue white, blue black, and blue red. Uh, generally, green blue is not not a, not a control deck that doesn't doesn't, doesn't tend to work out like that. Uh, and then ramp uh, mono green is the best ramp deck, but blue green is also a common pairing where you're, you're effectively splashing blue for cards like opposition, Glenlandra, Archmage, Upheaval, just powerful blue cards. Yep. Um, and if you're in blue green, one real important piece is Breeding Pool or Tropical Island, the two blue green duels, because this deck more than most has really stringent mana requirements where you need to be able to cast your Noble Hierarch or Birds of Paradise on turn one. But you also want to get double blue because mo- a lot of the good blue cards you'll play are double blue. Uh, and then for ramp, you also have like kind of big blue slash artifacts where you're, these are the like Karn, Consecrated Sphinx, Upheaval type decks that yeah. use, you know, this is where, where you can go if you get some busted mana acceleration like Ancient Tomb, Mana Vault, Worn Power Stone, Mana Crypt, you know, much less power, that sort of thing. And then blue red can also be ramped because of uh, wildfire and burning of Shinyi, which are again the same card. It's four and a red, four and two red rather. Uh, each player sacrifices four land; it deals four damage to each creature, so it wipes out a lot of uh, what the opponent mm-hmm. what the opponent yep. uh, ha- has put together. So th- th- those are the ramp decks. And then there's by a the pretty way, big those, section. Those are my favorite, by the way. Uh, oh, ramp. Yeah, I think the ramp decks yeah. are the, the a good ramp deck is really tough to beat, and I agree with you that mono green's the best. Uh, version of of that and if you have kind of the nut mono green deck it is it, the, the deck can produce the most mana of any deck in the in the format the quickest and it, it is devastating it also has the ability to to blow up your lands uh with their big finishers and that means that you don't get to come back so that's why i like yeah. it mm-hmm. so the the combo section is, is pretty big, and this isn't actually exhaustive, but some of the combo decks you can expect to see are Reanimator, which we talked a bit about earlier, which is ways to, to dump big things in your graveyard and bring them back. Uh, sneak Attack through the Breach, Splinter Twin, and then there's Storm. <laughs> so Storm combo is not one I want to cover in depth here because it would take a while, and also Storm traditionally does not have a very high win rate. <laughs> it's no. really fun, and I drafted it a lot. Really it's not. Yeah. It's not... It's not that a good storm deck is bad. In fact, a good storm deck might be better than anything else. But most storm decks are bad storm decks. It's really hard to get. This is like trying to string together enough spells to kill them with tendrils of agony or brain freeze. You know, generating mana with dark ritual and maybe Yogmoth's will or lion's eye diamond or lotus or high tide turnabout that sort of thing. Very mm-hmm. hard to draft, and uh, 
you know, you can, you can come watch my stream if you want to see how to draft bad storm. Uh, <laughs> there, there are a, a decent amount of other combo type decks, just single card combo type decks like Tinker and, and whatnot that kind of, you know, get, get you their channel, that sort of thing. But combo in the, the, the strength of the, of the blue red shell is that you could take a good blue red deck and then swap out the last five cards to be Splinter Twin or Sneak Attack or Ramp, maybe. And the good cards are good throughout. You know, the Mana Leak, Remand, Force of Will, Card Draw, Preordain sort of the stuff is good no matter what. And then that's just enabling you to put together the, the combination of cards you've chosen to try to win the game with. Right. So th- that's a good uh, look at maybe some of the archetypes that you'll want to take a stab at rather than those mid-rangey ones that we talked about. So if you do sit down to do your first cube, try to do one of the mono decks. You know, mono red's a little boring. Mono white is a little interesting. Um, but, you know, you can you can just stick to one of these color pairs that we've given you and just sort of see how it pans out and you'll learn you'll learn pretty quickly how it goes. I would not recommend drafting Storm right away unless you just, you know, are doing it for fun. It is really fun to try to figure out, but it's mind-bogglingly difficult to play if you've never done it before because <laughs> you have to know everything that's going on in your deck, what the chances are of drawing stuff in it, and it can get a little overwhelming. Um, I did want to talk about one more group of cards um, which or, or groups of cards, I should say, which is that what you will find is that there are many different groups of cards in the cube that are similar. They do similar things to each other. And of course, there is a hierarchy to them. Most of them are, are grouped in playables because it's the cube. But, um, you know, there's ones that you want. So I thought that I would just run over really quickly a few of those um, big groups. And then, Luis, you and I can give uh, an example of some of the best cards from that, in our opinion. So the first one that I came up with was Elves, right? Where in this cube, among others, you will find Lanor Elves, Arbor Elf, Findhorn Elves, Elvish Mystic, Avacyn's Pilgrim Elves of Deep Shadow, Jiraga Tree Speaker, you know, and then you get to the two mana stuff, and there's a ton there as well. In my opinion, for the green uh, mana ramp creatures, the best are Jiraga Tree Speaker and Rafelos. Yeah, I agree with those. Rafelos is probably the best overall. Definitely. Rafelos is green, green for uh, a two one and taps for a green mana for every, for every, uh, forest you control. So you play Rafelos on turn two, play a forest on turn three, and all of a sudden you have six mana. Yeah. Just taps for three, three mana. With just that one card. It's completely yeah. busted. Um, blue cantrips, of course. We talked about those. Ponder, preordain, brainstorm, charter course, getaxian probe, and the list goes on. There's a bunch of them in the cube. Um, I like preordain and ponder. Um, I like them better than brainstorm uh, in most of these decks. What do you like? Yeah, I, I think probably preordain is the overall best, mm-hmm. or at least the most consistent, because this is a blue for a scry two, then draw a card. Mm-hmm. Um, and then... Ponder and Brainstorm are actually more powerful, but you need shuffle effects in order to unlock that power. Yeah. Because Brainstorm without shuffle doesn't do much. Ponder without shuffle is a little better because you can always choose to just shuffle with the Ponder if you don't like the top three. Right. But Preordain is the best just by itself. And then, like on yeah, mm-hmm. yeah Charter Course and Probe are just fine cards. Yeah. But, and there's more. I mean, I, I, yeah, I just took some more. examples. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. M- mana yeah. artifacts. Mm-hmm. Uh, Signets, Worn Power Stone, Thran Dynamo, Grim Monolith, Basalt Monolith, Coalition Relic. I didn't put some of the one mana ones on here, but whatever. They're probably all on here somewhere. Uh, the best of the best, Soul Ring and Mana Crypt, just the cheapest. Yeah, and, and once you get past the like power-esque cards like Soul Ring or Mana Crypt. Mm-hmm. Mana uh, Vault. Mm-hmm. Like Signets, like the in particular, Is It Signet and Demir Signet are really strong, or Azoria Signet. Really, the any of the blue signets that aren't the blue-green signet, because blue-green has ramp fairly covered. Yeah. And then um, Warren Powerstone actually deserves a shout-out. It's three mana for an artifact that comes to play tapped and taps for two mana. And I really like Warren Powerstone uh, because by itself, it can accelerate you to like a turn four Consecrated Sphinx. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Extremely powerful. Um, big game enders. There's way too many to list here. Just think, you know, really expensive uh, creatures that, that generally end the game. I listed them by um, two different archetypes, which is Reanimator, and I have Grizzlebrand as the best one. Reanimator, remember, you need to be able to have the card sitting in your graveyard in order to have it count as a Reanimator. So, like Ulamog isn't one, or or you know, the the eleven mana Ulamog or whatever don't count so i have grizzlebrand um do you do you like any more than anything more than grizzlebrand the overall best card to put into play early with whether it's sneak attack or reanimator okay and then uh for ramp i have either crater hoof behemoth because it in most ramp decks will kill your opponent right away any creature based ramp um but also my favorite is also ulamog the ceaseless hunger 
Uh, that's a 10 mana Ulamog that exiles two permanents when you cast it and then uh, is indestructible and also uh, uh, exiles 20 cards from their library when you attack with it. This to me is the, is the premium colorless payoff uh, in the cube. Yeah, I, I, I generally like Crater Hoof in the green deck just because you can go get it with Green Sun Zenith or Natural yeah. Order, but yeah. but Ulamog is quite good as well. And then you, you also have the capability with cards like Shallow Grave on Corpse Dance. These are cards that mm-hmm. put, the, put the top creature card in your graveyard. Yeah, graveyard order matters for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, into play with Haste, but they're instants. So what you can do is do stuff like discard Emrakul the Aeon's Torn in response to the Shuffle Trigger, Shallow Grave, and put it into play. Yes. You can do this with makeshift mannequin as well. So th- there yeah. are ways to do it. It's just – it requires an extra step that usually you don't uh, – usually you can just get powerful stuff with that. Um, red burn spells, you got lightning bolt, chain lightning, burst lightning, lightning strike. You see in a, <laughs> a, a theme here. Best – well, lightning bolt and uh, – what is that stupid card called? Sack two mountains for four damage. Uh, fire blast. Fire blast. Yeah, I, I, saw, I saw sack two mountains for four damage. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fire blast. So the Lightning Bolt's the overall best because it's good in any deck. Yeah. Uh, but Fire Blast is insane in mono red because what, what you do is you just curve out and then on turn four you go Lightning Bolt, you Fire Blast you, and then often they'll just be dead. Right, exactly. And that's yeah, a, a messed up on that card was in, was in standard. <laughs> that is that – I'm glad I didn't play then. Um, there was just tut- all these double Fire Blast games that just ended on turn four. Yeah, that's just crazy. Uh, there's tutors. Um, there's some that are true tutors like uh, Demonic Tutor, for example. And then there's a whole bunch of them that put the card on the top of your library, which is a much different thing than a, than a regular tutor, you know, Vampiric Tutor um, – mystical tutor those type of cards uh i just have demonic tutor is the best yeah, tutor it's just, the best. it's just the best one um there's rituals there's all types of red and black uh you know cards that you pay mana for and then they produce an additional mana or two i'm assuming dark rituals the best of the bunch though it might be the threshold one would that cost one in a black i don't know oh cabal ritual no i, I so dark dark ritual is the only one that you'll play outside of storm because i like this card in like reanimator for example mm, mm-hmm but uh, in storm, it's also the best. It's just it's just the the most efficient one mana for three for three mana. Yeah, because normally uh, you pay like two mana and you get three mana, or four mana you get five. Yeah, all the you know. all the red rituals are a little a little a little dorkier. Yeah, um, there's black removal spells. I didn't rank them because honestly, these aren't priority type cards. But you know, th- there's cards like tragic slip, doom blade, that kind of stuff. Um, discard spells. Um, the best of the bunch. There's a whole suite of of uh, black discard spells, but Thought Seize and Mind Twist, with Mind Twist being the best one. I mean, Mind Twist is is broken for sure. You know, if you can, especially if you combine it with any type. Yeah, of it's, uh, X in a black mm-hmm. sorcery target player discards X cards at random. This is like one of the first cards to get restricted. So it's so brutal. Uh, counter spells. Basically, every counter spells in the cube. You've got actual counter spell all the way to the one mana stuff to the free stuff. Um, it's all here in the cube. Uh, the best one easily is Mana Drain. It is completely stupid. Blue, blue, counter target spell. And at the beginning of your first main phase, you get the amount of colorless mana that that spell costs. <laughs> and you just get it dumped into your mana pool and you can spend it on whatever you want on your next main phase. So it's it's counter spell. It's, it's literally strictly better counter spell. Um, and then there's also, I wanted to give a shout to Force of Will because... Uh, when players do go all in like they do often in a cube with a big ramp strategy or reanimator strategy, having a free counter spell can be really good. Uh, there's draw sevens. These are cards that basically, uh, in conjunction with other things in some different ways, allow you to draw seven cards. And usually it's both players. Um, cards like Time Spiral uh, that we talked about, or Time Spiral is the one that I have is the best, but uh, Time Twister is the one we talked about before, Wheel of Fortune. That kind of thing. But I like Time Spiral the best. This is four blue, blue for each player shuffles their graveyard in hand into their library, then draws seven cards. So you think, well, why do I have to pay double the mana of Twister? It's because you get to untap six lands when you play it. So you actually get to use those cards right away. Yeah, somehow they made a better Time Twister. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Despite that being kind of an honorary member of the Power Nine at this point. But yeah, ti- yeah. so Time Spiral is, the, is also, it's one of the few ones I'll play outside of Storm. Because in general, I think Wheel of Fortune and Time Twister and Memory Jar Special are just not good enough unless you're storming off. But because Time Spiral untaps all your lands, I actually like it in decks like Sneak Attack or even Kiki because you can untap all your lands and just kill them. Sometimes. Yes, 
Totally. And then again, there's multiple groupings of cards. I wanted to kind of get, again, the big picture view. There's also a bunch of reanimation spells in this cube as well, like exhume, reanimate, um, unburial rites. There's a, a, the ones that you mentioned, the instant speed ones that bring them back for a card. There's makeshift mannequin. There's a necromancy. There's a ton of different ways to get cards from the graveyard back to the battlefield. I think reanimate's just the best one. It's like the cheapest. It lets you do the most broken things. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Oh, reanimate's certainly the best one. Okay. It's, later in the game, it becomes worse because you, you have to pay seven to nine life for, for whatever it is you're getting back. But this is the one that leads to turn one gristle branch where yeah. you're like, Swamp, Dark Ritual, and Tomb Reanimate. I, I guess in that particular case, you could use any of them. But even just the, the you know, being able to just cast this uh, on turn one or two without yeah. having to spend yeah. extra mana is pretty big. A mox or whatever. So at any rate, there, there's, of course, more groupings of cards, but these are kind of the major ones. And just to give you an idea of the types of things that you're going to find, because when you're drafting a green deck and you want to get a bunch of, um, you know, mana creatures, you're going to see Lano Elves, Arbor of all of these different options. And it is useful to know which ones are the best and which ones you should prioritize. But also, they're kind of interchangeable. You know, all the one mana uh, creature, you know, uh, ones are roughly the same. Um, you know, a lot of them are literally the same. I mean, there's literally three copies of Lano Elves in this cube. <laughs> there's Elvish Mystic and uh, what's it called? And Lano Elves as well as the, the other one, Findhorn Elves too. So you'll see that happen a lot, um, you know, where they're like functional reprints of each other in there too. Do we have time for our crack a pack, Louise? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so... Like I said, I, I have a, a screenshot from an earlier draft, so let's just get right into it. First card up is Go for the Throat. So uh, this is one in a black um, instant destroy target non-artifact non -artif creature. This is a type of card that you can ignore in cube in the early stages. Uh, next is Gideon Jura. This is a three white white planeswalker. I'm not going to read oh, the whole thing, but yeah. So you, once you once you once you read three white white, you can also move on from from pretty one. much <laughs> from first picks. Yeah. Uh, next is Abbot of Carol Keep. This is a one and a red two one prowess creature, and it lets you exile the top card of your library and play it until end of turn. Um, again, this is just there is still a gradient in power level, and we're looking for better than this. Um, wear and tear. So this is a sideboard card. Uh, again, I, I'm going to kind of cruise through these. I know that uh, we're going a well, little bit I, I do want to. Mm -hmm. I do want to note that uh, Wear and Tear is – so this is white, destroy target, enchantment, one in a red, destroy target, artifact, and you can play either or both. Yep. I, I, uh, I, would, I would play Wear and Tear in, in my main deck if I ever had a deck that had both red and white mana. Which you've I, never had, so. Well, sometimes you're just guy. Okay. Let me tell you. Would you really? Like if you're yeah. red, white, aggro, you're not playing this. No, but I'm never going to be red and white aggro. That sounds terrible. Hey, you're never going to be red and white. <laughs> you're not red, splashing. No, just, if you're just guy, you're splashing for one of those colors. You're not splashing. I tend to I tend to play this card in just guy because just because especially since just guy is usually blue red splash white and okay. one in a red destroy target artifact is not that bad in vintage cube. Almost everyone has targets. Oh yeah, you will find a target and the, and if you nab an enchantment with it too, that's kind of a blowout. All right, here's our first big hitter from our pack: mana. Fault. One mana taps to add three mana to your mana pool. This is like Soul Ring, but it adds an additional mana. The problem is it doesn't untap during your untap step. You have to pay four mana during your upkeep to untap it. And if you don't, and your draw step, it does one damage to you if, you, if it's tapped. Yeah, so this is a colorless dark ritual kind of. <laughs> yes, and it is repeatable, but not for a long time. Yeah. Still, uh, it's really powerful and certainly better than these other options we've had so far. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like Mana Vault. It's not the same as uh, something like Soul Ring or Mana Crypt, which you can just put in any deck and they're going to be fantastic. Mana Vault, you need to be going pretty big because it's a, it's just a little harder card to use than those two. Yes. You really need stuff that consistently has three plus colorless mana in their cost. Yep. So if I first pick Mana Vault here, which is fairly likely, my aim is to be like a big Mana Blue or yeah, you some kind of brand. liberated. Or, or, Mm -hmm. or, or mono green ramp, it's it's quite good there too. Yeah, another shortcut for Mana Vault is to think of it as a one shot that sometimes you get to use again. But if your deck doesn't want just a one shot boost of three mana, um, then then it's less important for you. Uh, next is Is It Signet two mana artifact? You can pay one and tap it to add blue red to your mana pool. Really good card, but still that is a Mana Vault over there. Oh boy. Yeah, I would take Mana Vault over Is It Signet though. That's right. not that far. I tell you what, our next card also starts with mana. 
It's mana is it crypt. Mana crypt? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Zero so this is a mana zero artifact. mana artifact that taps for two colorless. So it's already better than Soul Ring right there. The the part that makes it worse than Soul Ring is during your upkeep you flip a coin, and if you lose the flip, you uh you pay three life or you, you take three damage rather. So <laughs> it's it's really funny because uh you you it, it combines broken fast acceleration and coin flipping, which is just everyone's favorite. Yeah, <laughs> it's just the worst to, to come. And also free spells, right? Like everybody loves a free spell. It's funny, a mana crypt. That three life is that three damage potential is actually a lot higher. Obviously, it's one and a half damage per turn on average. But I'll tell you what, there's a lot of times my opponent plays Mana Crypt and I'm like a slower controlling deck and I'm like, all right, win condition acquired. <laughs> like that's, we, need to, we need to start having our opponent lose some flips here. Yeah, I would well, take it here, it, though. It's going to be hard. So if we were to discount Mana Vault and Mana Crypt, my picks currently is it Signet, which shows you the value <laughs> of mana. The top three cards so far are all artifacts that provide mana. Right. Um, one little trick for Mana Crypt, by the way, don't play it on the first turn if you're not going to use it. Play it on the yeah. turn you're going to use it. You don't want to give any extra flips, especially for opponents trying to beat down. Next is Massacre Worm, three black, black, black for a 6-5 Worm. When it enters the battlefield, creatures your opponent's control get minus two, minus two until end of turn. And whenever, whenever a creature an opponent controls is put into a graveyard from the batter, battlefield, that player loses two life. Perfect example of an extremely powerful card that just gets overlooked in the cube almost every time. Yeah, it's... Cards busted. I mean, if you play it against a creature deck, it is devastating. It often just kills them, and it's just like completely not even – I wouldn't even see this card in the pack. It's so low on the pick order. It's, it's utterly I, I saw, replaceable. I saw a funny uh, a funny screenshot from one of my friends playing Cube Stunlock, who, who, who's a mod on Twitch. He had a sneak attack and a mana untapped, and his opponent was comboing with Kikijiki Pestermite, and he had Massacre Worm in hand. <laughs> oh, no. So <laughs> when opponent opponent finally wants to go to like, combat, it's like GG. <laughs> The opponent's probably thinking, like, oh, you're going to make me play it out? Whatever. Yeah, and, right. and then just get Masker Wormed for infinite. <laughs> for all of it. Uh, next is Mana Morphos. It's one and a green-red hybrid. It's an instant that adds two mana of any combination of colors to your mana pool, and you draw a card. This is an important card for Storm, but not usually where you want to start. Um, next is Arbor Elf. So here's a, here's a nice one mana elf. I'm always in the market for these. Green for a 1-1. One, one. It taps to untap a forest. So you do need to make sure you're playing enough forest. But since it costs green, you often have them anyway. Uh, but again, none of these compete with these colorless options, particularly Mana Crypt and Mana Vault uh, being, you know, so powerful. <sighs> okay, this pack keeps getting better. Next is Jace the Mind Sculptor. Maybe you've heard of it. Uh, again, I'm not going to read out everything on the card. If you haven't seen it, you can check out the video version of this podcast and you'll see the thing, but it's just reading Planeswalker stakes forever. But Jace uh, is one of the best mid-range finisher blue cards in the queue, but I still don't like it better than the than the mana. What about you? I, yeah, if mana, if mana Crypt weren't here, I would take Jace. I think it's better than Mana Vault. Okay, okay. But I, unfortunately, I Mana Crypt is here. Yeah, I think it's close, and I wouldn't fault you for taking Mana Vault, but uh, I, I find Jace to be incredibly powerful. Well, I'm going to put you to the test on that Mana Crypt in just a minute. Our next card will not. It's often last picked. It's called Honor of the Pure. It's one in a white enchantment. White creatures you control get plus one, plus one. Terrible uh, card. Yeah, not great. I don't even play it in white. Like yeah. You want your cards to stand on their own because they do die or get messed with sometimes. So you would need to be like all in on tokens to make Honor of the Pure good. Can I interest you in a mox? Mm. Is we it, opened is the it worst blue box? mox. It is the worst mox. mox. Pearl? Yep. I would probably start with Mana Crypt over Mox. Oh, man, that's close. Yeah, okay, here's what it is. I would start with Mana Crypt over Mox Pearl because I just want to draft something big. I actually think the right pick might just be Mox Pearl, to be honest. Okay, be yeah. This is interesting. If, if you end up in white, you'd rather have Pearl than Mana Crypt, I think. And it's a lot safer to just have, take Pearl first because you don't need that big of a deck. And especially if you end up in a white weenie, it's just, just great. It's just completely busted. Uh, one thing that we should note here that we did uh, touch on briefly before, but that is worth bringing up again now that we're actually facing the choice. Picking a Mox Pearl does not mean that you're in white. No, no, it does so not. Keep that in mind. Uh, next is Past in Flames. So this is three and a red sorcery. Each instant and sorcery card in your graveyard gains flashback until end of turn. The flashback cost is equal to its mana cost. And it also has flashback itself of four and a red. So three and a red, four and a red for the cost. This is a storm finisher um, and certainly not something that you'd want to start with. Uh, I mean, you'd take Manamorphos over it probably anyway. 
uh, at, at any rate, uh, it's not even on the list at all with all the, this yeah. is a busted pack. Last card is Prismatic Vista Land. Tap, pay one life, sacrifice it to search your library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield, and then shuffle. Uh, so it really does come down to the mana, and that is often the case early. And really, it's between Mana Crypt and Mox Pearl. And it's kind of a, you know, which one do you want to do? I would take Crypt, actually. Um, I yeah, like going yeah. big, and I would just do the Crypt thing. But I think it's close. So my, my, my rank here is Crypt, then Pearl, then Jace, then Mana Vault, then Is It Signet. Those are like the top five picks out of this pack for me, which is a pretty good pack. You, someone's going to get a good fifth pick. And I think mine would be Mana Crypt, Mox Pearl, Mana Vault, Jace, Signet. I think that's the order that I would have it. I just value yeah. the, the mana like extremely high. Okay. And, and you know, yeah. and someone might even get some of these cards later because if you've took three green cards, then fourth pick, I'd, I would just take Arbor Elf over like, is it Signet? So, right. Exactly. Yeah. That yeah. does happen all so, the time. Look, I, th th this sounds like a lot, right? We, we went through a lot of kind of complicated stuff here, but cube is really insanely fun because you just get into new game situations and there's all these cool, really cool interactions that you would never have thought of that just happened consistently. And cube is just a way to, you get to pick whatever kind of magic you want to play. And to a degree, you just get to play it. If you want to play mono red beatdown or mono white beatdown, you can play it. If you want to play control, you can, if you want to play combo, you get to kind of live all the dreams. And in a well-constructed cube, which I believe the, the magic online cubes tend to be, there's no uh, traps of combo cards that don't actually work. The closest, I guess, is like show and tell and Eureka. I don't think those particularly work, but just about everything else does. Reanimate is a real deck, you know, storm, well, storm trap suckers like me who, who, who are trying to be clever, but <laughs> all these monogreen ramp decks, these sneak attack decks, these Kiki decks, they're all, they're all good and they all can kind of get there. So I think it's really cool that cube kind of lets you just, you know, do all this stuff that's pretty neat. Yeah. And I agree. I think you should have a green light in, in the vintage cube on magic online. Like I can vouch for that. All of the decks that you think are there when you see a card, they, they exist. They might be a trap sometimes in the sense that they're not very good, but that's just true for any archetype. Like if you draft show and tell, it's not very good, but there's plenty of huge stuff to put into play. So well, you can do that, you know. And the other thing about cube is you also just kind of get to it. It's a little ice cream for dinner ish compared like it's very decadent compared to normal formats, but it's good to have some of that. I actually don't wish cube was on all the time. I'm glad it's not. But when it is on, I have a really good time playing. Same. So try it out. And it's not just on Magic Online. You can build your yeah. own cube. You can do a, a modern cube. You can do a cube of the, the sets that are in standard. Like it, it is literally how Luis described it earlier. It's a group of cards to draft similar to the group of cards that you draft that is a set, right? It is curated, meaning that somebody put time in to decide. And that's what a cube is. It's just a draft set. That's all it is. So sure, some of them are huge, flashy, insane stuff like on Magic Online where these cards are really hard to get your hands on in real life. So, you know, assembling the vintage cube would be quite uh, an undertaking, but there's all different types of them. And, you know, that's frankly why I like playing it on Magic Online, because there's no nonsense with assembling all these insanely expensive cards and I can just play it. And then, you know, that's it. They go away. Highly recommend it. It really is the pinnacle. Even if you're on your way up, you're going to have to dive in. It's going to suck for a little while and then you're going to love it. I've seen that happen numerous times, including with myself. Uh, and, and I'm sure it'll happen for you, too. That's going to do it uh, for the show this week. Uh, if you want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. I want to say thank you to all of our patrons once again, especially all you new folks. Thank you so much for coming along. Patreon.com slash limited resources. And there's a sale going on at Channel Fireball. They are trying to do everything they can to keep everything running on the content side. Help them out. Channelfireball.com slash sale for the information there. You can get a, a nice little bonus on just cards you are going to get anyway. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind. Um, you know, when you, when you're stuck at home and that kind of thing to channelfireball.com slash sale. That's going to do it for this one. We'll see you next week. So we, we actually just uh, announced a cool program in the middle of our show. Uh, but I, 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 I took one of my rare Twitter breaks to just, just check it out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh God, what is it? Oh, who's we, by the way? We is in this case, uh, Channel Fireball Events. Oh. And the reason I want to highlight this in, in the sign off in particular, because this isn't as much an ad as a way to support your local game store. So what this, what this is, is if you, uh, use your game store's code and we, we just sent all the game store's codes. And if you're, if you're, lo if you're an LGS owner or someone who knows an LGS and they don't have a code, Tell them to contact CFP Events. We'll get you one. If you use your your LGS's code when you're playing in Magic Fest online or buying Magic Fest in a box, either of those, uh, your LGS gets ten percent. 
So what? it's a way that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So it's an affiliate program that lets you, when you decide if you want to participate in one of these events or, or do a magic fest in a box, any of these things we're doing, you can get your LGS 10%. They don't have to do anything. All they have to do is, is give you the code and then, and you put in that code at the time of purchase. So damn, that's really neat, man. I, I didn't know about this. Yeah. It, it, well, you didn't because it just came out during the show and, uh, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. yeah, I'm just, I'm surprised. That's really cool. Yeah, so that basically what 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 we and wizards are trying to do is help support LGSs uh in this time that's pretty difficult because they have to have their doors shut pretty much, you know. And mm-hmm. and it, that's obviously very difficult for a game store. And I know some are doing like curbside delivery and stuff like that, and, and that's all fine. Um but at the core of it, when you can't have people kind of gather to play, that that really makes it life harder for uh, local game stores and local game stores already don't have kind of the easiest path. Like it, it's a tough right. business. So uh, again, if you go to cfbevents.com, you can find more details. But the the impetus behind this program it really is to let you choose your local game store and support them if, if you if you buy one of these things. So um, I, I don't know. I, I kind of wanted to just give a shout out to that because uh, what I don't want to have happen is at the end of all this when we can all you know leave our homes once again not have a place to play that would suck and i would would really feel for the people who are going to be in that spot so hopefully this helps somewhat i mean you know we're doing what we can and i think uh this will help awesome